Hi, it's been a little while since I did some reading, so I thought I'd better catch up on some. So this is chapter two from The Rooftoppers. There was in the offices of the National Child Care Agency in Westminster a cabinet, and in the cabinet a red file marked Guardian's Character Assessment. In the red file there was a smaller blue file marked Maxim Charles. It read C.P. Maxim, a book is bookish as one would expect of a scholar, also apparently generous, awkward, industrious. He is unusually tall, but doctor's reports suggest he is otherwise healthy. He is stubbornly certain of his ability to care for the female ward. Perhaps such things are contagious because Sophie grew up tall and generous and bookish and awkward. By the time she turned seven, she had legs as long and thin as golf umbrellas and a collection of stubborn certainties. For her seventh birthday, Charles baked a cake. It was not an absolute success because it had sagged in the middle, but Sophie declared loyally that it was her favourite kind of cake. Because, she said, the dip leaves more room for icing. I like my icing to be extravagant. I am glad to hear it, said Charles, although the word is traditionally pronounced extravagant, I believe. Happy, uh, happy probable birthday, dear heart. How about a little birthday, Shakespeare? Sophie had ha the habit of breaking plates, and so they had been eating their cake off the front cover of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now Charles wiped it on his sleeve and opened it in the middle. Will you read, uh, will you read me some of Titania? Sophie made a face. I'd rather be Puck. She tried a few lines, but it was slow going. She waited until Charles was looking away, then she dropped the book on the floor and did a handstand on it. Charles laughed. Bravo! He applauded against the table. You look the stuff that elves are made of. Sophie fell over onto the kitchen table, stood up and tried again against the door. Wonderful, you're getting better, almost perfect. Almost, Sophie wobbled and squinted at him upside down. Her eyeballs were st starting to burn, but she stayed where she was. Aren't my legs straight? Almost. Your left knee looks a little uncertain. Anyway, no human is perfect. Nobody since Shakespeare. Sophie thought about that later in bed. No human is perfect, Charles has said, but he was wrong. Charles was perfect. Charles had the same hair Charles had hair the same colour as the banister, and eyes that had magic in them. He had inherited his house and all his clothes from his father. They had once been beautiful, razzle dazzle, dazzle, savile row, one hundred per cent silk, and were now fifty per cent silk, fifty per cent whole. Charles had no musical instruments, but he sang to her, and when Sophie was elsewhere, he sang to the birds and to the wood lice that occasionally invaded the kitchen. His voice was pitch perfect. It sounded like flying. Sometimes the feeling of the sinking ship would come back to Sophie in the middle of the night, and then she found that she needed desperately to climb things. Climbing was the only thing that made her feel safe. Charles allowed her to sleep on top of the wardrobe. He slept on the floor beneath her, just in case. Sophie didn't entirely understand him. Charles ate little and slept rarely, and he did not smile as often as other people. But he had kindness where other people had lungs and politeness in his fingertips. If, when reading and walking at the same time, he bumped into a lamppost, he would apologise and check that the lamppost was unhurt. One morning a week, Miss Elliot came to the house to sort out any problems. Sophie could have said, what problems? But she soon learned to stay silent. Miss Elliot would look around the house, which was peeling at the corners and the spider webs in the empty larder, and she would shake her head. What do you eat? It was true that food was more interesting in their house than in the homes of Sophie's friends. Sometimes Charles forgot about meat for months at a time. Clean plates seemed to break whenever Sophie came near them, and he so he served roast potato chips on atlases of the world, spread open at the map of Hungary. In fact, he would have been happy to live on biscuits and tea and whiskey at bedtime. When Sophie first learned to read, Charles had kept the whiskey in a bottle labelled cat's urine so that Sophie would not touch it. But she had uncorked the bottle and sipped it and then sniffed at the underside of the cats next door. They were not at all similar, although equally unpleasant. We have bread, said Sophie, and fish in tins. You have what? said Miss Elliot. I like fish in tins, said Sophie, and we have ham. Do you? I've never seen a single slice of ham in this place. Oh, every day. Or, she added because Sophie was more honest than she found convenient, definitely sometimes. And cheese and apples, and I drink a whole pint of milk for breakfast. 
But how can Charles let you live like that? I don't think it can be good for a child. It's not right. They managed, in fact, very well, but Miss Elliot never quite understood. When Miss Elliot said right, Sophie meant she meant Sophie thought she meant neat. Sophie and Charles did not live neatly, but neatly, uh, the Sophie thought, was not necessary for happiness. The thing is, Miss Elliot, said Sophie, the thing is, I don't have the sort of face that ever looks neat. Charles says I have untidy eyes because of the fleck, you see. Sophie's skin was too pale and it showed blotches in the cold and her hair had never in her memory been without knots. Sophie did not mind though, because in her memory of her mother she saw the same sort of hair and skin and her mother, she felt sure, was beautiful. Her mother, she was sure, had smelt of cool air and soot and had worn trousers with patches at the ankle. The trousers, in fact, were perhaps the beginning of the trouble. When Sophie was nearing eight years old, she asked Charles for a pair of trousers. Trousers? Is that not rather unusual for women? No, said Sophie, I don't think so. My mother wears them. Wore them, Sophie, my child. Wears them, black ones, like, but I'd like mine to be red. Um, you wouldn't prefer a skirt? He looked worried. Sophie made a face. No, I really want trousers, please. There were no trousers in the shops that would fit her, only the grey shorts that boys wore and, good heavens, said Charles, you look like a maths lesson. So Charles sewed four pairs himself in brightly coloured cotton and gave them her, to her wrapped in newspaper. One of them had one leg longer than the other. Sophie loved them. And Miss Elliot was shocked and, girls, she said, don't wear trousers. But Sophie insisted that they do. My mother wore trousers. I know she did. She used to dance in them when she played her cello. She can't have, said Miss Elliot. It was always the same. Women do not play the cello, Sophie. And you are much too young to remember. You must try to be more honest, Sophie. But she did. The trousers were black and greyish at the knee and she wore black shoes, I remember. You are imagining things, my dear. Miss Elliot's voice was like a window slamming shut. But I promise I am not, Sophie. I am not. Sophie did not add, you potato-faced old hag, but she very much wanted to. The problem was that the person could not grow up with Charles without becoming polite to their very bones. To be impolite felt to Sophie like wearing dirty underwear. But it was not difficult to be polite when people talked about her mother. They were, they were so very certain that she was making it up, and she was so very certain that they were wrong. Toenail eyes, whispered Sophie. Buzzard, I do remember. She felt a little better. Sophie did remember her mother, in fact, clear and sharp. She did not remember her father, but she remembered a swirl of hair, two thin cloth-covered legs, kicked to the beat of a wonderful music, and that wouldn't have been possible if the legs had been covered in a skirt. Sophie also was sure she remembered very clearly. Yes. Sophie did remember her mother, in fact, clear and sharp. She did not remember her father, but she remembered the swirl of hair and two thin cloth-covered legs kicked to the beat of wonderful music that had, wouldn't have been possible if the legs had been covered in a skirt. Sophie was also sure she remembered very clearly seeing her mother clinging to a floating door in the middle of the channel. Everybody said a baby is too young to remember. They said, you are remembering what you wish were true. She grew sick of hearing it, but Sophie remembered seeing her mother wave for help. She had heard her mother whistle. Whistles are very distinctive. No matter what the police said then, she knew her mother had not gone down inside the ship. Sophie was stubbornly certain. Sophie whispered to herself in the dark every night, my mother is still alive and she's going to come for me one day. She'll come for me, one. she'll come for me, said Sophie to Charles. Charles would shake his head. That is almost impossible, dear heart. Almost impossible means still possible. Sophie tried to stand up straight and sound adult. People believe you more easily if you are taller. You always say, never ignore a possible. But my child, it is so profoundly improbable that it is not worth building a life on. It would be like trying to build a house on the back of a dragonfly. She'll come for me, said Sophie to Miss Elliot. Miss Elliot was more blunt. Your mother is dead. No woman survived, she said. You mustn't allow yourself to get carried away. Sometimes it seemed difficult for the adults in Sophie's life to tell between carried away and absolute correct but unbelieved. Sophie felt herself flushing. She will come, she said, or I will go to her. 
No, Sophie, that is not how the world works. Miss Elliot was sure that Sophie was mistaken, but then Miss Elliot was also sure that cross-stitch was vital and Charles was impossible, which just goes to show that adults aren't always right. One day, Sophie found some red paint and wrote the name of the ship, the Queen Mary, and the date of the storm on the white wall of the house, just in case her mother passed by. Charles's face when he found her was too complicated for her to look at, but he helped her reach the high parts and wash the brushes afterwards. A case, he said to, uh, a case, he said to Miss Elliot, of the just-in-cases. But she's, she's only doing what I have told her. You told her to vandalise your own ho house? No, I told her not to ignore life's possibilities. That's the end of the chapter. Okay, and here's chapter three. Miss Elliot did not approve of Charles, nor of Sophie. She disliked Charles's carelessness with money and his lateness at dinner. She disliked Sophie's watching, listening face. It's not natural in a little girl. She hated their joint habit of writing each other notes on the wallpaper in the hall. It's not normal, she said, scribbling on her notepad. It's not healthy. On the contrary, said Charles. The more words in the house, the better, Miss Elliot. Miss Elliot also disliked Charles's hands, which were inky, and his hat, which was coming adrift around the brim, she disapproved of Sophie's clothes. Charles was not good at shopping. He spent a day standing, bewildered in the middle of Bond Street, and came back with a parcel of boy shirts. Miss Elliot was livid. You cannot let her wear that, she said. People will think she is deranged. Sophie looked down at herself. She fingered the material. It felt quite normal to her, a little stiff from the shop, but otherwise fine. How can you tell that it's not a girl's shirt, she asked. Boys, shirts, button, left over right. Blouses, please note, the word is blouses, button, right over left. I am shocked that you do not know that. Charles put down the newspaper behind which he had retreated. You are shocked that she doesn't know how uh, know about buttons. Buttons are rarely key players in international affairs. I beg your pardon? I meant she knows the things which are important. Not all of them, of course. She is still a child, but many... Miss Elliot sniffed. You'll forgive me. I may be old-fashioned, but I do think that buttons matter. Sophie, said Charles, knows all the capitals of the countries of the world. Sophie, standing in the doorway, whispered, almost. She knows how to read and how to draw. She knows the difference between a tortoise and a turtle. She knows one tree from another and how to climb them. Only this morning she was telling me what it is, what is the collective noun for toads. A knot, said Sophie, it is a knot of toads. And she whistles. You would have to be extraordinarily unintelligent not to see that Sophie's whistling is unusual. Extraordinarily unintelligent. Or deaf. Charles might have well have not spoken. Miss Elliot swept him aside with a single flick of her fingers. She needs new shirts, please, Mr Maxim. Women's shirts. And my lord, those trousers. Sophie didn't see the problem. Trousers were just skirts with extra sewing. I need them, she said. Please let me keep them. You can't climb up in a skirt, or you can, but then everyone would see your pants, and surely that would be worse. Miss Elliot frowned. She was not the sort of person who admitted to wearing, pa admitted to wearing pants. We'll let this pass for now. You're still a child, but this can't go on forever. What? Why not? Sophie touched the bookcase with her fingertips for luck. Yes, it can. Why wouldn't it? It certainly can't. England is no place for untrained women. Above all, Miss Elliot disliked Charles's wish to take Sophie on sudden expeditions. London was dirty, she said, and Sophie would catch germs and bad habits. On the day of Sir Sophie's probable ninth birthday, Charles stood her on a chair and polished her shoes while she ate toast with one hand and read a book with the other. She turned the pages with her teeth. Crumbs and spit coated the corners of the paper, but it was otherwise a satisfactory arrangement. They were almost ready to leave the house for the concert hall and Miss Elliot stormed in. You can't take her out like that, she's filthy. And don't slouch, Sophie. Charles looked with interest at the top of Sophie's head. Is she? Mr Maxim, barked Miss, uh, Miss Elliot. The girl has jam all down her top. Oh, so she does. Charles looked at Miss Elliot with courteous bewilderment. Does it matter? Then seeing Miss Elliot's hand reach towards her clipboard, he took the cloth and sponge at Sophie as gently as if she were a painting. Miss Elliot sniffed. There's some on her sleeve too. The rain will wash the rest off, surely. It's her birthday. 
Dirt still applies on birthdays. You're not taking her to the zoo. I see. Would you rather I took her to the zoo? Charles tipped his head to one side. He looked, Sophie thought, like a particularly well-mannered panther. It may not be too late to change the tickets. That isn't what I meant. She'll disgrace you. I would be embarrassed to be seen with her. Charles looked at Miss Elliot. Miss Elliot's eyes dropped first. She has shiny shoes and shining eyes, said Charles. That is smartness enough. He handed Sophie the tickets to hold on to. Happy birthday, my child. He kissed her forehead, a once yearly birthday kiss, and held Sophie, helped Sophie from the chair. There were so many ways Sophie knew of helping people from their chairs. It is a very revealing thing to do. Miss Elliot, for instance, for instance, would prod you off with a wooden spoon. Charles did it carefully by the fingertips as though they were dancing, and he would whistle the string section from Cosy Fantuti all the way down the street. Music, Sophie. Music is mad and wonderful. Yes. Charles had kept her birthday plans a secret, but his excitement was contagious. She skipped alongside him. What kind of music would it be? Classical, Sophie. His face was alight with happiness and his fingers were twitching at the tip. Clever, complicated music. Oh, that's wonderful. Sophie was an unpractised liar. That would be so good. In fact, Sophie thought she would rather have gone to the zoo. Sophie had heard almost no classical music and she would have been quite happy to keep it that way. She liked folk songs and music you could dance to. Very few, just her nine-year-old, she imagined, could have said they liked classical music without lying a little. The performance did not, as far as Sophie was concerned, start promisingly. The piano piece was long, the pianist had a moustache and made the sorts of faces that Sophie, Sophie associated with it being very itchy. Charles, Sophie glanced at Charles and saw his lips were slightly open and curved upwards in an expression of the very listening happiness. Charles, yes, Sophie, you must try to whisper. Charles, how long does this go on for? I, I mean, it, it's not that it's not wonderful. Sophie crossed her fingers behind her back. It's just that I wondered. Only an hour, my child. Alas, I could live here in this seat, couldn't you? Oh, an hour. Tro Sophie tried to sit still, but it was difficult. She sucked the end of her plait. She curled and uncurled her toes. She resolved unsuccessfully not to bite her thumbnail. She was, on the at, she was at last on the borderland of sleep when three violins, a cello and a viola, came on stage accompanied by their musicians. When they began to play, the music was different. It was sweeter and wilder and Sophie sat up properly and shifted forwards until only a half an inch of her bottom was on the seat. It was so beautiful that it was difficult to breathe. If music can shine, Sophie thought, this music shone. It was, all, it was like all the voices of the choirs of the city rolled into a single melody. Her chest felt oddly swollen. It's like 8,000 birds, Charles. Charles, isn't it like 8,000 birds? Yes, but shh, Sophie. The melody quickened and Sophie's pulse kept time. It sounded at once familiar and new. It plucked at her fingers and her feet. Sophie's legs wouldn't stay still. She knelt up on her seat and after a moment she risked a whisper, Charles, listen, the cello sings, Charles. When the music closed, she clapped until the rest of the audience had stopped, until her hands were hot and blotched with red. She clapped until everyone was staring at a little girl with lightning-coloured hair and a ladder in her stockings, whose eyes and shoes lit up the whole of the second row. There was something in the music that felt familiar to Sophie. It feels, she said to Sophie, like home. Do you know what I mean? Like, like fresh air. Does it? Then I think, said Charles, we must get you a cello. The cello they brought was small, but it was still too large to play comfortably in her bedroom. Charles unstuck the skylight in the attic, and in those days in which it did not rain, Sophie climbed onto the roof and played her cello up amongst the leaf mould and the pigeons. When the music went right, it drained all the itch and fret from the world and left it glowing. When she did not, when she did stretch and blink and lay down her bow, down, lay down her bow. Hours later, Sophie would feel tougher and braver. It was as though, it was as, it was, she thought, like having eaten a meal of cream and moonshine. When practice went badly, it was just a chore, like brushing her teeth. Sophie had worked out that the good and the bad days divided half and half. It was worth it. Nobody bothered her up on the rooftop. She was flat, it was flat grey slate with a stone balustrade running around the edge. The balustrade came up to Sophie's chin. 
People below, looking up, could only see the shock of bright hair and a bow elbow. I love the sky, Sophie said one night without thinking at dinner. She bit her tongue. Other girls laughed as she said things like that. But Charles only laid a slice of pork pie on the Bible and nodded. He said, I'm glad. He added a dollop of mustard and handed Sophie the book. Only weak thinkers do not love the sky. Almost as soon as she could walk, Sophie could climb. She started with the trees, which were the quickest route to the sky. Charles came with her. He was uh, not a no-don't-hold-tighter sort of man. He stood underneath her and shouted, Hiya, Sophie! Yes! Bravo! Watch out for the birds! Birds look wonderful from underneath. Chapter 4 will be later.